Um, my name is Michael Eanes, and I'd like uh, to thank the organizers of uh, Canola Week for the opportunity uh, to present an update on our research uh, in relation to starch metabolism and canola. Um, uh, the work was funded uh, in part by Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada's Canola Cluster. Um, the award was to myself and my collaborator, Ian Tetlo, but I really must give all the credit for the work that I'm going to show to Dr. Li Ping Wang, who's done an extraordinary amount of work and, as I hope you will see, achieved a great deal. Now, the background uh, to this project was really uh, one that was entirely fortuitous. So our uh, research background was very much in starch metabolism. Um, but even in oil seeds, uh, where we tend to focus on the uh, oil quality or oil amount that's being produced, starch is still the major carbon reserve. Um, and that's because carbohydrates are the currency uh, that the plant uses to transport energy uh, around. And indeed, about 30% of photosynthetic carbon uh, that's produced uh, uh, or fixed during the day uh, is stored as transitory starch uh, and then broken down again at night to sustain growth. Now, starch is made of two glucan polymers. The first is the linear chain amylose, which requires only a single gene, the granule bound starch synthase, using ADP glucose as a substrate. The second poly polymer, which predominates, uh, particularly in the brassicaceae, uh, in the leaves, is a myelopectin. And this is the much larger branch chain uh, polymer. And that requires three uh, groups or classes of enzymes to um, produce the branch structure. The first class of the starch synthases, currently we know of five isoforms. There are the starch branching enzymes, of which I will say more shortly, and also the debranches branching enzymes or isoamylases. Now the starch branching enzymes on which we're particularly focused um, are the uh, enzymes which are responsible for cleaving the alpha-1,4 bond of a growing chain of glucose residues and creating a new chain by forming an alpha-1,6 uh, bond with uh, the adjacent uh, linear chain. So we create a new end from which the starch or myelopectin can grow. And in Arabidopsis, there are just two genes uh, that carry out this reaction, SB2.1 uh, and SB2.2. Now, really, the background to the project was entirely fortuitous and serendipitous, and that was that we were doing some studies using Arabidopsis, the model plant, in which we knocked out starch synthesis by knocking out both branching enzyme genes that are present. So you can stain for starch with iodine, and it shows up very clearly black. And in the mutant, which is rather smaller and straggly, uh, you don't get any starch produced. And we then complemented these mutant lines uh, with two, uh, one of two different genes, uh, both from ZMAs. And these were endosperm-specific maize starch branching enzymes, the class uh, 2B protein and the class 1 protein. And it's important to note that the Brassicaceae only contain the class 2 and not the class 1. And the class 1 enzymes have very different properties, uh, catalytic properties from the class 2. Now, our focus was on starch metabolism, but in fact, what we found quite fortuitously and serendipitously is that by complementing uh, the mutant with either one of these maize endosperm genes, we saw, compared to the wild type, a very significant increase in the biomass of these plants. And this was published in the Plant Biotechnology Journal about five years ago when I first spoke at this meeting. And as a consequence of this change in biomass, we also saw a significant increase in the seed yield per plant. The seeds themselves are essentially unchanged. They're not bigger, um, they're not smaller, uh, and the oil content is the same. So the seed yield per plant was improved about threefold for reasons that we would still like to understand. And the number of the basis for this was really an increase in the number of siliques per plant, which increased, you can see, massively compared with the wild type. 
particularly in the SBE1 transformers. So the goal then was to transfer the technology which we'd accidentally discovered in Arabidopsis to canola. The rationale for this is fairly obvious. Arabidopsis is a diploid, but it's also a member of the Brassicaceae. Um, and many of the genes are highly conserved in canola, which of course is a tetraploid with two genomes, A and C. The strategy we adopted to see if we could replicate anything of this effect in canola was to generate a canola null mutant using the gene editing or CRISPR-Cas9 system. And we chose to do this in the double haploid cultivar DH12075. Part of the reason for selecting this cultivar is that the um, genomic databanks developed by uh, Isabel Parkin allowed us to investigate the different genes uh, involved in uh, the starch branching. And having made mutants uh, in uh, canola, we then uh, intended to express the maize starch branching enzymes in those mutant lines. Now, when we first interrogated the genomic database for DH12075, we saw that there were four identifiable uh, Brassica napus starch branching enzyme isoforms. And so the goal was to use CRISPR-Cas9 to edit these genes, i.e. Uh, mutate them and knock them out. And the way we did this uh, was to target all four genes that using uh, each gene was targeted with two small guide RNAs um, in two plasmids, one targeting three of the genes and one the fourth. Um, and both were driven by the Yao promoter. Uh, the reason for the selection of this promoter is, first of all, it is expressed everywhere, but it also um, has the advantage that it minimizes chimeric mutations. Now, when you carry out this kind of gene editing, you'd expect a number of possible results. So here's the wild type uh, shown here with no mutations. And you will find uh, either monoallelic or biallelic mutations, and they might be heterozygous or homozygous. In fact, what we found was that all the SBE mutation we obtained when uh, targeting those four genes were biallelic or monoallelic heterozygotes which was a little bit of a surprise. But when we examined the mutations, uh, that is the indels in the DNA, then we saw, as we would have expected, a range of effects that range from small insertions and deletions in the sequence, nucleotide substitutions, and large fragment deletions. But further genetic analysis, because of uh, this unusual segregation, led us to discover that there were two additional genes uh, for Brassicanapus starch branching enzymes. Um, the first one was uh, an identical locus to the starch branching enzyme 2.2 on chromosome, uh, a, uh, chromosome 10 of genome A. And by carefully assessing the, all the sequencing chromatograms and doing a segregation analysis on those, we discovered also an additional duplicated copy of one of the 2.1 starch branching enzymes. So this meant then that there are actually six starch branching enzyme genes that we'd now characterize in uh, DH12075. And of course, what that necessitated was two further rounds of CRESPR in order to knock out uh, both of these genes. So after a huge amount of work uh, with uh, leaping very much at the helm of this, uh, we've obtained mutations in all six SBE genes. So here are the different genes and chromosomes. Here's the wild type, so all genes are present. And then we have a, a number of uh, mutants with various gene dosages. And in particular, I want to draw your attention to the first um, mutant uh, we produced, which was the quadruple mutant targeting the four genes that we expected to find. And then the sextuple mutant, which we uh, were able to develop as a function of further CRISPR editing of the quadruple mutant. Now, if you look at the starch branching enzyme activity in these lines, uh, as you uh, decrease uh, or the number of genes that can be expressed, 
the activity goes down, as you would expect. But to our surprise, we still also found a little bit of activity even in the sextuple mutant. And the reason for this is that, in fact, uh, the mutation produced a, a frame shift, uh, but a frame shift that was uh, still able to be transcribed and produced a modified active protein. So the protein is there still, but uh, perhaps less catalytically active. Because we already had the quadruple SB mutants available to us from the first rounds of CRISPR, we decided to see whether the expression of the maize SB1 had any effect on Canova. Now, I emphasize that these were carried out in controlled environment conditions. But what you can see, even visually, is here's the wild type at the point of uh, silic maturity, and here are three independent lines. Um, and what you notice is that the number of siliques as a function of the number of stems have increased um, in the independent lines compared to the wild type. The individual seeds remain similar to the wild type, but the number of stems and the number of siliques associated with those stems has increased. And if you measure the total seed weight produced by these quadruple mutants expressing the maize SBE1 gene, what we see is something like a gain of 30 to 50% in total seed weight, depending on the line. Now, the work on the sextuple mutant was, of course, delayed because we had to um, produce it from the quadruple mutant. But one of the things that Li Ping observed was that the sextuple mutants, uh, which are lacking all of the branching enzymes, essentially, or have mutations in them, have much thicker stems. So here's the wild type, here's the sex tuple mutant. Um, you can do the numerical analysis, but you can see visually, um, and this uh, thickening is associated also with shorter internode distances. Um, in the same position, the sex tuple mutant has about double the cross-sectional area of the wild type. So we wondered if this might, in and of itself, have any useful function in terms of tolerance to either drought or heat. And so the experiment that was to perform was to take the wild type and sex tuple mutant. So there's no branching enzymes being expressed in the sex tuple mutant, and um, simply grow them and uh, determine uh, the amount of seed that was produced in control conditions, and then following drought for 10 days. Now, of course, as you would expect, um, because it's, it's a mutation in all of the branching enzyme genes, there's a bit less seed being produced in, in the sex tubal line. However, you expose it for drought for 10 days, round about the middle stage of flowering, then you see an increase relative to the wild type in seed production. If you then superimpose on this at the early flowering stage, a heat treatment at 28 degrees daytime, 23 degrees nighttime for three days, then you see that again, of course, because of the heat treatment, flowering uh, and seed production is impaired, but the sex tuple mutant is doing twice as well as the wild type particularly if you water them in between the heat treatment and then the trout. But if you have no watering in between the heat treatment and drought, then in fact what you see is a further reduction in yield of the wild type uh, compared to the sex tuple mutant, which shows, although an overall reduction compared to uh, ambient conditions, uh, shows about a fourfold increase over the wild type in terms of seed production. Now, we are at the stage where we have now the ZMSB1 being expressed in the sex tuple mutant, but we've only got to the T1 stage in terms of analysis, because and all of these are heterozygotes. But even here, you can see an increase in the number of siliques and the seed weight uh, for these plants compared to the wild type. But clearly, we need to take these through to homozygosity, which is likely to further improve that picture. But equally important, perhaps, is the fact that uh, even in these lines, which are now the homozygous lines, which we uh, literally have just developed recently, 
in which we're expressing the SB1 gene in the sextuple mutant, you can see that the thick stem has been retained in these lines compared to the wild type. So we're now at the situation where we're growing these to maturation. Uh, these are homozygous lines. And we'll be able to measure the yield and also to investigate to what extent they retain um, the improvement as a consequence of uh, abiotic stress. So it seems that we might be getting both a high yield and abiotic stress tolerance. So to summarize where we are in all of this, uh, we've been granted a, a patent already. Uh, this was granted earlier this year on methods of increasing oilseed production. A paper on the CRISPR-Cas9 work was uh, recently accepted for publication in plant physiology. We're applying for further funding, understandably, uh, to include multi-site field trials. And of course, it's important to acknowledge all the support we've had, including from the Canola Council and Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, as well as Genome Canada and various uh, other provincial and federal sources. Thank you very much for your attention.